we're delighted to have John Baker here, the uh, founder, president, and CEO of Desire to Learn. He came in from Waterloo to speak to us today, so uh, we're very pleased about that. Just a little bit about Desire to Learn. I think John will take, will explain a lot more than I possibly could. But uh, he started it in 1999 at the age of 22, and since then he's grown it to an amazing uh, 600 employees and more than 8 million users, and that's been done without any uh, outside funding, which is incredible. Until recently, and then you go, and then he'll talk about that. Um, he has been honored with the the Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award from the Greater Kitchener Waterloo Chamber of Commerce, the KPMG Ex Excellence in Technology Award, and the Waterloo Region Record 40 Under 40. Um, through Desire to Learn, he's committed to collaborating with clients to improve human potential globally by providing the most innovative technology for teaching and learning to make e-learning accessible to all. Um, as a, the Director of Entrepreneurship Education here at Mars, uh, we are closely watching all the cool things going in, on in e-learning and Desire to Learn is a great model for uh, a great Can Canadian company that's achieved a lot. So I'm delighted to welcome John. Thank you very much. You must get the excuse a lot, it's uh, difficult getting to Mars. Uh, no, that doesn't come up all the time. <laughs> I just wanted to uh, share a little of the Desire to Learn story. But before I do, I, I want to understand who's in the audience. Are, are you s building startups or uh, how many are doing that? Okay, how many are coming in from like a technology background? Okay, uh, educators, couple, okay, great. And one with the camera. <laughs> Uh, others, where, where else are you coming from? Am I allowed to make this interactive? Is that, yeah, that's okay. Go ahead. Like, just shout out a few th things that you're up to or doing. Services. Services. Uh, okay. Preventative healthcare. Preventative healthcare. Finance. Finance. So basically all over, all over the board. Is, is that accurate? Okay, great. <laughs> uh, so I, just to give you a little bit of background on, on me and, uh, and some of my adventures, um, and I'm not sure if you can see this very well. I think this, the slides have been crunched a little bit. But uh, my first venture as a, as a kid was selling Kool-Aid. How many did that? Uh, I, I was like, I, I thought, you know, and, and there's a little screenshot or zoomed in version. That's my sister, by the way, that was helping. You know, I thought 20 cents a glass, which was the, the advertised rate for, uh, for tourists, 10 cents was for locals that knew the real rate, uh, was actually a lot. And then I saw these ads now on TV where they're actually selling lemonade for a dollar. I was kind of shocked by the inflation of uh, Kool-Aid <laughs> over the last few years. Uh, but you know, for me, it was uh, really setting a simple goal, which was to upgrade that tricycle uh, to a Honda 50, a motorcycle. And uh, as a kid, when you're in grade one, that's an ambitious goal. You want to really uh, you know, do everything you can to, to achieve it. And my, my parents were smart. They, uh, they made me rent the stand. They made me pay for the Kool-Aid. They made me keep a ledger on expenses. They made me pay my sister. Um, and then uh, obviously introduced me to the whole concept of banking. And back then you used to get like 12% interest in the bank, which was awesome watching your money grow. It doesn't seem to do that anymore. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, as, as, I, as I grew up, you know, I, I spent a lot of time uh, being what me, most people would call a nerd, uh, you know, playing, uh, playing games on my PC, but also pr learning to program when I was in uh, my, my younger years. Uh, so, you know, who, who wants to just play Pac-Man when you can actually build a better version of Pac-Man uh, that allows you to eat more cherries? Uh, and, and so, you know, being able to uh, be immersed in that technology at, at a young age probably had a big impact on where I went in the future, even though I didn't really know it as I was, as I was going through. Uh, I, I actually went to university, I'm not sure how many of you sort of pivoted in your, in your direction as you go into university, thinking I was actually going to become a doctor at the end of the track. Uh, so my parents coached me, instead of doing a, a general biology degree, maybe try out engineering uh, and then go into medicine. Um, and I actually was, was going down that path, and, uh, you know, and, but focused a lot of my uh, projects on the medical space. Uh, and also started taking things like intro to anatomy and uh, kinesiology courses and a whole bunch of other things. And I've, I've actually found it quite challenging uh, as, as I went through that. And I'll, that sort of jumps ahead a little bit. but. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting how your, your early choices in, in which degree to take uh, actually leads you down various different paths as, uh, as, as you're about to find out. Um, at Waterloo, how many are actually Waterloo grads? Or am I in a U of T kind of scenario here? Yeah, Waterloo, Waterloo, okay. Well, U of T, great. I've got lots of friends who went to U of T. I hung out here all the time. <laughs> I lived just college and, and Bathurst for a long time. So uh, great, great schools all around. 
when, when, I, when I did my engineering experience, uh, we did everything from you know, design projects that uh, allowed us to, to look at a microelectronic uh, heat transfer on, on circuitry and build like a, an early web-based version of a, uh, of a tool where you can actually place chips on a board and actually look at and analyze the, the heat uh, on those uh, circuit boards. You know, pretty interesting. And then I did uh, an ECG machine, which uh, was hooked up to your personal computer, which at that time you literally had to have on a cart plugged into the wall. Uh, you know, it was uh, an early version of being able to like, you know, monitor your heart, uh, but just didn't really have the compute power that you could put into your pocket that you have today. Uh, but the, the real project that really sparked me down the entrepreneurial path uh, was when we were given not just a design project where you're, you go off and you solve a problem that's defined for you. Uh, it was come up with a problem, like go, go find something in the world to solve, uh, and, and then uh, come back with a solution. And in, in our case, we actually focused in on the crutch, and we, we built a crutch called Sidearms. Any, anyone been on crutches before? So uh, permanent nerve damage can result from like leaning on them too much, uh, hard to go up and down stairs. You know, lots of people can rhyme off all kinds of problems with crutches. Uh, but we tackled the problem. We uh, went into the kin labs. We tested it. Uh, the crutches that we came up with used less energy. They allowed you to go up and down stairs. They just changed the points of contact on the body. So, you know, made it look like a regular crutch, but uh, operated quite differently. And we won awards. We went on to all these competitions. Uh, and it was at that time where I was trying to decide what I wanted to do for my last co-op experience. Uh, and for me, it was a decision of, do I go off to Microsoft or some of the other big tech companies that were recruiting at the time? Uh, or, in, and what I did was I actually said, instead of doing that, how about I just do something fun for the summer that I was really passionate about and just take a break from it all before I get into the real world? Um, which, you know, uh, <laughs> my parents were questioning that. Uh, the university questioned that. I don't know of anyone that didn't question my sanity when I said I was just going to take the summer off. Go back to, if you know where Holmesville, Ontario is, which is a, a hamlet just outside of Goderidge, Ontario, which you, you might not even know where that is, but it's about uh, two hours west of here, right on Lake Huron. Uh, you know, worked out of a bedroom that was on air conditioned, so you had to work in the morning and work in the evenings, and during the day you'd go off and play beach volleyball or compete in some, some other type of activity. Uh, but it was building uh, something that I was passionate about, which was taking education, combining it with everything that I learned from engineering, uh, whether it's internet technology or other types of uh, engineering challenges that I was faced with, combining the two to really revolutionize the delivery of the educational experience. Uh, and when I was attending university, which doesn't seem that long ago, but it feels like it's a little bit long ago now, um, you know, cassette tapes and faxing and assignments was the mode of distance education. Uh, and so the idea of being able to take the internet uh, and digital technology and really have a big transformational impact uh, was something that was resonating for me as a problem I wanted to tackle. I uh, started you know, with, just like most entrepreneurs, not quite sure what to do. Knocked on a lot of doors. I asked a lot of my former profs, hey, would you like your course online? Had to explain what, did that, what that meant. <laughs> and, then, and then slowly built a client after client after client uh, and built, uh, built what, we are, what we are today. But you know, for me, you know, everyone talks about finding your passion and being passionate about what you're doing. I hear that a lot these days. Uh, you know, the, the thing that triggered me on the entrepreneurial journey wasn't, was that combined with uh, problem finding and the discovery of going out and looking for a problem that exists out there in the world, zeroing in on something that you're passionate about that is a big problem, uh, and being able to go off and try to find and develop really creative solutions to tackle those challenges uh, it was what triggered for me just going off and being an engineer or being a doctor to actually building a company uh, that was focused on uh, this challenge. I never thought I was going to be an, you know, uh, an entrepreneur. When I went to university, that wasn't even an option on the list of things I was considering. Uh, and certainly it was a challenge. Like, for example, I went back to university after that first summer, and I did not make enough money uh, to pay for my last year of tuition. And they didn't believe that I didn't make enough money. They wouldn't give me a loan. They wouldn't do all this other stuff. Which, you know, uh, they would today. They, they like the university today would absolutely do all of that. And they're, they're very supportive of entrepreneurship. Uh, and, but they work with me. They, they try to, you know, figure out how to do co-op evaluation when I wasn't really a co-op working for somebody. They, they helped through all those challenges and they actually set up a lot of programs uh, afterwards. The, but those challenges sometimes, those barriers that get thrown in front of you are sometimes the best thing that could ever happen to you. Uh, I, I feel very strongly that as you're building a company, 
It's not the good times and the easy sales and all of that other activity that defines the company. It's the challenges that you're faced with and how you tackle them and how you deal with them that build the real character and the real values within the organization. So like, just to give you like a snapshot of what we do, just trying to change the way the world learns. Um, <laughs> you can laugh, it's okay. It's a big vision. Uh, so how, how, do we, how do we look at that problem? So we look at it from a technology perspective. So moving from like on-premise desktop type of applications to pushing things to cloud and mobile, uh, everyone kind of gets that. Uh, we look at the delivery model of brick and mortar, so face-to-face, -face, like what we're doing here today, to obviously you're leveraging digital and, and what I would call is more blended learning experiences or, or fully online. A lot of people think when we, what we do for technology is just e-learning and, and just online learning, but 90% of the use of our technology is to blend what happens in the classroom with online, 90%. And if, and if you look at uh, the real adoption in K-12, it's now moving towards blended, not just online. Uh, and but if, you, but if you look at uh, universities, it's a really interesting experience because uh, if you look at distance education programs, like, like let's say, for example, at the University of Guelph, which has just skyrocketed, 80% uh, of the students that are distance education or open learning students are actually from on campus. So students are actually picking this method of delivery to schedule it into their lives or, or to do, you know, uh, to work it, in, work it in so they can work at the same time as doing school or, or for whatever reason. They're, they're selecting this, this, choi this choice of delivery. Uh, and interestingly, if you, if you look uh, globally, uh, at least at our client base, we're seeing online growing at 40, 50, in some cases 60% year over year for our clients, whereas traditional face-to-face -face, uh, attendance is growing maybe 3%. Uh, so you know, this is a model that's certainly outpacing uh, the traditional method. We also see a huge opportunity on transitioning like traditional paper-based activities like textbooks. How, you guys still carry around textbooks, those that are still in university? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't get that. You know, there's this thing called the web <laughs> and digital. Uh, and so, you know, why not be able to leverage that technology to really have an impact? Because, you know, uh, there's some barriers there, but the idea of being able to like share notes and collaborate as a study group on a particular text or resources, or, or in our case, we really think that we can even make that personalized. So if you're struggling on a resource, it could provide additional resources to you automatically. It doesn't have to be the concept of a textbook. We think of it as more like a binder with here's your textbook and your, your other resources or other uh, material that you can stitch together, along with more of a recording of all of your personal learning journey so you can go back and reflect on it and share experiences with others. Uh, we, we also think the education model is m moving much more towards uh, a personalized experience. And that's tough. I don't know if you know how, how much education is growing, but globally there's a massive demand. Uh, you know, to the point of you know, China, I think, announced that they want to have 200 million graduates from higher education in the next uh, 15 years. Uh, they've got, they were graduating about 8 million. Uh, so that's a big growth number. Uh, you know, other statistics point to another 100 to 150 million students coming into the system, almost a doubling of higher education alone. Um, how's that going to happen? You know, we're not going to build the buildings anymore to be able to accommodate the growth. You know, if you, if you think about the traditional like landline scenario, did we implement landlines in Africa? No. We jumped a generation and went straight to, you know, to wireless. Uh, you know, as, as we go tackle this demand issue uh, and try to match that up to the supply, you know, we're going to have to start thinking about different, uh, different solutions, if you will. Um, Obviously, the transition from print to digital is happening at a, at a rapid pace. Uh, this, is, this was taken on my, I know I still use a BlackBerry, um, <laughs> taken on my BlackBerry at uh, Oxford University Press, where um, you know, we're helping them with a small pilot of 3.5 million users to like, take them from you know, print to a digital format. Uh, that's going to happen at an incredibly rapid pace. I don't, I don't, think, uh, I don't think anyone's really ready for how fast that's going to occur. Korea set a goal in the next three years of having all textbooks digital. Uh, the U.S. Department of Education set a goal of, uh, by 2017 of having all textbooks digital for K-12. Uh, there's not been a lot of progress on it, but I think it's like the Genome Project. You'll see like huge progress towards the last couple of years uh, as it ramps up. You know, uh, a lot of people talk about flipped classroom. You know, I, I, everyone here's probably heard about Khan Academy and all kinds of other resources that are being uh, op openly shared on the web. We see this open educational resources as a huge opportunity, as, as along with uh, op massively open courses, 
They don't have to be free. I, I think the huge uh, issue here has been really an access issue. Uh, whether it's paid for or free, you know, it's, it's really up to the uh, institution. And we're seeing some really interesting models there. I, I'm, I'm not sure if I should be talking about all of those. Maybe that's a Q&A kind of uh, question. But the, the big one here is the shift from just uh, flipping the classroom to really thinking about students as producers, not just consumers. Uh, and the idea of uh, differentiating and elevating the quality of the education experience to engage students in creating knowledge, not just uh, disseminating it to those students. Uh, and, and I think the sooner that we can get to that model, uh, the sooner that we, uh, we increase the value of the education system and the education that we're providing. Another huge one that I, I'm seeing more and more, and I see this as I travel around the world, is learning built around a community. And more so, I would, I would argue that it's being more embedded in the community. Uh, so I see this here in Mars, where you have you know, universities working hand in hand with business, working hand in hand with entrepreneurs uh, to really develop the talent and develop the, the sector and create a knowledge economy. Uh, that's got to happen at an elevated pace uh, globally, uh, and not just in the big cities like Toronto, uh, but in the small towns. What, why, why should the knowledge economy only be in the big cities? That's a big question that I have. Why, why can't it exist in a small uh, remote town where they can do their own internet startup? There's, there's no reason why it can't. Uh, and we're doing some really interesting projects in that area as well. But you know, if, if I look at an example of this, uh, um, a trip to Brazil with the governor general, I got an opportunity to introduce some of the work that some of our clients are doing around what they call the Thousand uh, Women Program or Thousand Women Project. Uh, and this project uh, was so touching to hear these two women share their experiences about how they never finished elementary school, how they were completely uh, living under the, you know, living in poverty, uh, and how they finished their elementary school now through this program, finished their high school, finished a college program, and are now working. And not only did it transform their lives, uh, but it also transformed the lives of their young kids uh, and the next generation. You know, if, if we look at education as an opportunity to elevate not just, uh, not just you know, the elite uh, within, within the countries, but also to help change the poverty uh, mix, I think, um, I think we'll, we'll be much further ahead. Th this was so touching that the president on that trip committed to rolling aside to now 100,000 women. Uh, and it's, it, it's a good example of, of how that country is focused on, uh, in the last two years, have lifted three, 35 million people out of poverty with very small little projects like this one uh, that have a massive impact. Uh, and so two years? in the last two years, two years, the, the size of the country of Canada yeah. been lifted out of poverty. So if, now uh, there's a lot more work to be done. It's a big country and poverty is a huge issue there. Uh, but they're obviously trying innovative programs to engage, uh, engage the citizens. Uh, similar problems, I, like this, again, this was a marketing deck that was put together for me <laughs> in some cases. Some of these are my photos, some of these are not. I don't know where this is. I think we're going <laughs> to pretend this is Ontario, uh, northern Ontario. Um, it looks colorful enough. Um, it's in the Arctic. It's in, yeah, it might be up in the Arctic somewhere. We do have clients in Nunavut and other locations, but the, the interesting one here is uh, about 10 years ago, this is what really drove the motivation for building this company home was we got an email from a parent 10 years ago uh, saying, in the past, I used to send my kids off to school in Thunder Bay, which is about 600 miles from their community. Uh, and today, they're able to stay home with their parents in their community and finish their high school education. Uh, and that wasn't, that wasn't possible before. And so if you can imagine like, how you know, this type of technology can not only uh, you know, uh, help it elevate outcomes and, and results, but it can also help keep families intact and how it can start breaking down barriers that exist to education like geography. Uh, you know, just a funny story, that's a picture I took. Uh, I'm a big believer in what we call experiential learning. Uh, so where you go, like if you're somewhere, try to experience the area. So I was told, oh, there's this, you know, nice river in the Amazon, I was in Manaus. Uh, and so I'd go down the Amazon. Why, why wouldn't you want to do that? If I learned how dangerous that was later. But um, <laughs> I went down and actually uh, saw the location where the two rivers merged together. Uh, one coming in from the mountains, which is all cold and milky in color, and the other uh, more of a Coca-Cola color and, and really hot, warm and hot. And like there's a line where you can just literally put your hand in the water, drag it across, and feel the difference. It's an incredible experience. But like 
you, you get these unexpected things that happen. So we got passed all the time by these things. And, and if you haven't been able to guess what they are yet, uh, they're school buses. And I, and, I, and I keep forgetting, like, oh, you're right. Like, how else would you get students uh, that live in villages along the Amazon to school? They're not going to trek through the jungle. They're going to go up and down the river. But think about how that has an impact on the learning experience, right? They've got a, you know, they show up at class late and they leave early. And why? Because it's dangerous to go up and down the Amazon when it's dark or getting close to dark. Uh, so, you know, uh, our environment, our society, all of these things have a big impact on the educational experience and challenge us to come up with creative solutions to, to those problems. Experiential learning I just talked about. This is a photo. I don't know how some of our staff think it's, uh, you know, we have clients that pay for them to actually go visit spots like Rome and China to see experiential learning in action I, like, and document, like, here's how students learn when they're in Rome. Like, that, they literally get paid to do that. And I, I still, trying to figure out a way for me to be able to justify myself going for one of these two-week trips. Um, but it's incredible to see how students are now aligning what they do on a trip to Rome with their educational curriculum so that when they come back they can get credit for, uh, for the trip. Uh, and so the ability for us to look at the classroom not just being constrained to the, you know, the class but also looking at it as the whole world. So does that give you an idea of who we are and what we do? some of the challenges. So I wanted to talk a little bit about like, how we've gotten to where we are, a little bit more of the entrepreneurial story. Talk a little bit about the early years. So uh, you know, in the introduction, they said, uh, we built this company uh, bootstrapped, no, no outside funding. We did that uh, up until, uh, I guess we did the announcement September 4th of last year, where we announced uh, we raised uh, $80 million, which is not bad for the first round. Apparently, that's the largest amount that's ever been dis disclosed as a as an initial VC around in Canada. Um, we didn't know that. Uh, you know, we, oh, we thought, that's what, doesn't that happen all the time? No. <laughs> I don't know why that doesn't happen all the time. There's some great companies uh, in this country that, that should get the support. Um, but we, we did that, and I, I can talk a little bit about that a little bit later, but we did that really to accelerate the growth and to make the investments that we're wanting to make to, to, to get where we're going. But in the early days, we did this from, like, uh, the hard way, if you will. Uh, you know, fighting for every client, uh, building great technology, having to be 10 times better than the competition that was you know, 100 times bigger than you were, uh, all the challenges that you're probably experiencing as, as entrepreneurs building your own organizations. And I, I'd be glad to take some questions on that too. There was a video, um, which I don't think we'll play in this one. Nope. <laughs> but there's this really cool video showing like, how we used to like, knock down walls in the office with sledgehammers as we continued to expand. Um, Many, you know, what you don't learn is like, you know, as you break down the wall on the other side, it's all covered in dust. <laughs> or uh, maybe we should have checked to see if there's any electrical in the wall before we did that, or, or there's this thing called a permit required. Um, <laughs> but, you know, when, when you're building a, a company, you know, the initial team that you're, you're creating, the culture that you establish, uh, the people that you bring on board, you know, getting their commitment for the long term, these are all huge challenges. Uh, and you know, we as a company went from one person to five pers people to one person to eight people to two people. Like the early days were up and down for the first two years. You know, we, we went through a lot of trying to find out what, what, what will it take to find the right people to help us build a, a real company here. Uh, and when we did, it clicked. You know, it was, it was interesting. We went after this one huge opportunity in, uh, we were going after opportunity after opportunity here locally and getting rejected. I don't know if you've been rejected like 100 times in, a, in the run of a month, but it's not a lot of fun. And uh, we've, we finally said enough's enough. It's springtime. Maybe we'll take a trip somewhere to like maybe Vancouver just to get out of the office. And oh, by the way, there's this educational conference there that we can go talk at, make it a business expense. Um, and so we went and we did this little presentation uh, and someone in the audience stood up and said, I'm the director of so, such and such. Uh, can you come do a, a presentation for us? Uh, and I, and I went, sure, I'm not really doing anything else. Uh, when would you like that? How about today? Sounds great. Did the presentation, uh, and within the next three days, we actually won a, a, like a massive client. And you know, we got through this whole pricing negotiation. Like It started off with, well, how much is this going to cost? And I said, under a million. And they laughed pretty aggressively. And then we said, OK, a lot less than a million. <laughs> uh, it came to a settling point, which we thought was a reasonable offer. And later on, after the deal was done, they said, your competition was going to charge us three times. So thanks very much for making that a real good deal for us. 
And we went, oh. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it just, a light bulb went on. Oh, people are willing to pay for this technology because at that time, in our space, everything was free. Uh, like our, most of our competition was charging very little or, or nothing for the local universities here in Ontario. Uh, and most of the competition started off as like open source or free. And so all of a sudden we were able to find a, like a, a key client in the backyard of our main competitor at that time uh, that was really interested in and the pricing was something that could build a sustainable business. Because it's tough to build a sustainable business that's bootstrapped without having some revenue coming in the door. Uh, and then we said, okay, well, where else can we go get uh, clients? Where's there another big market? What would you think of? Maybe the US. <laughs> And so, you know, we, we went down to do like a, a conference in the U.S. in Wisconsin. Uh, we, found a, uh, we found out about the process of RFPs, which we didn't know about up until that point, which was a lot of fun. In case anyone's ever done one of those, do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, and we had more people evaluating us through the RFP process for the whole state of Wisconsin than we actually had as employees in the company. So when we went in to do the presentation, there was four of us doing the presentation, which represented about a quarter of the company. Uh, and they had 35 people evaluating us on our technology for over two days. It was intense. I mean, you know, we were doing everything from like coding as we went along with the demo, which I'm not sure if that should have been recorded. Um, but <laughs> you know, we were doing everything we could to win that. Now, they knew everything. I mean, as they went through their evaluation, they, they did more due diligence on us than, than you, you would believe. Uh, but, but what we had done was we had demonstrate, demonstrated to that client uh, that we could actually build something that helped them achieve their vision and their direction that no other competitor could in the space. Uh, and we did so not by looking at what the competitors were doing, but by making something completely revolutionary and different. Uh, and then it just happened to meet the client's needs. Uh, and the interesting thing is we didn't celebrate when we, we found out that we won that deal. We actually celebrated uh, after we came back from the presentations and we realized that we had a chance of winning. It was the fact that we actually came together as a company and in like three months that we had been working on this project had done Herculean stuff. Like we were wrapping ourselves with Christmas lights, which doesn't work today because they're LED, to stay warm at night. Um, we were, you know, as we were coding, we were uh, taking shifts as we're, as we're developing. People would fall asleep at the keyboard and you say, Daryl, wake up, and he would just keep going. Uh, you know, we were doing everything we could to build the technology of the future. Uh, and at the end of the day, that demo was a reinforcement that we had achieved that, that goal. And uh, what was interesting is we, we celebrated that, that milestone. Uh, and when we actually won, we were like, oh no, now the real work begins. <laughs> um, but taking time to reflect on as you're building your organizations is important. And you know, we, we don't do it enough. Uh, there's a lot of hard work that goes into building these companies. Uh, and making sure that you take those milestone moments and reflect and see where you're going and make sure you're course correcting uh, are all really important. Setting a clear strategy, obviously you know that. There's been lots of courses here on that. How do you do that? Um, lots of plays to use. I really like the sports analogies. You know, you've got to be able to count on your, your team around you. Another analogy that I use as you're growing your company that it has been a focus on building the leaders within the organization. I always talk about the bonfire. So like if, you, if you're a leader, you're, you know, you're the center of the bonfire. You know, as people crowd around you, they stay warm. But as more and more people crowd around you, they get colder as you get towards the back. Right? So if you don't build a team of leaders uh, that can spark their own fires, that can build their own bonfires and spread that through the company, uh, then the team very quickly uh, can, can you know, crumble. Uh, for us, one of the things that we try to drive is like innovation. It's a huge priority for us. We, have about 40% of our team that does R&D. Uh, they're always striving to, to you know, tackle the big problems. We, we call it RIT week. I don't know why it's called RIT, relentless, I don't, know, I don't know, improvement time. I have no idea what, what it's called. I, I should probably find that out. Relentless in innovation time. Maybe we'll, we'll stick with that one. Uh, but we give a week off each year for uh, all of our development teams so that they can actually work on whatever project that they come up with, uh, work in teams, work as individuals, but to an opportunity to express their creativity uh, and what we're finding is a lot of those innovations actually work their way into the products. Uh, so everything from like geo-learning to really cool creative like help uh, systems to all kinds of different applications have made its way into the system based upon the cool innovations that come out of uh, unlocking some of that innovation. That's not the only thing we do, but innovation for us has been a, a huge priority. So building these companies, I talked a little bit about some of the challenges. Um, 
you know, we, we've had a lot of challenges <laughs> along the way in building this company. I'm happy to take questions on them. You know, we've had competition. That wasn't, by the way, from us. I, that was a, maybe I shouldn't have had that one since this is being recorded. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we, we, we've been up against like a huge juggernaut in our space. Uh, you know, it, when we were a small company, we were, we were going up against this company that had 400 people when we had, you know, five. Uh, and, you know, um, as we won deal after deal after deal after deal, uh, we even got sued by them down in Texas. Ha ha do I need to go into that story? No, probably. It, it was like a, it was a huge battle. Uh, I can't characterize what it was all about, but it was, we didn't think it was right, uh, so we, we fought very, very aggressively. Uh, and as a small company, uh, we, we chose the route of being completely transparent about what was happening. We, s we created a real simple rule, and it was the only rule that I think uh, that allowed us to survive as an entity. And that was, you tell your staff immediately, you tell your clients right after that, and then you tell the world. Uh, and I think that helped us build the trust, uh, uh, both within our team, that we're going to share the good, the bad, the ugly, uh, as well as with our clients, that we're going through this together. And what was amazing about that journey, uh, even though we were fighting in a jurisdiction that had an 88% win rate for the other guys, um, I don't know what the other 12% were. Maybe there were ties. I, I, don't, I don't know of too many people that won um, in that jurisdiction. It, it was a tough battle. Uh, and you, know, you go through uh, this, ex this expense and this strain on the organization, uh, and you, you, you sh you know, the people that are there that are committed to the vision, that are passionate about what you're doing, stay. The people that are not, leave. Right? And we do everything that we can to build that alignment and that, that momentum around that. Uh, but it, it's, that's a huge challenge. What was amazing about that journey was that we didn't lose clients along the way. So we fought for about three and a half years, this battle. And remember, we're still self-funded, trying to, you know, we have to take the money that comes in from clients to pay the bills, including the legal bills. I mean, this was a huge challenge. Uh, and when we actually got to Texas, we actually thought we won. Like, we literally, we're like, there's no way that they won based upon that case, but we lost. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's little interesting stories, like, the, I had a little sticky note, uh, and now the competition will know this story, but we'll, like, I had a, a simple little letter on there saying, uh, A. It was the letter A. I was like, for the love of God, please define the letter of A. And you might ask, is A an indefinite or definite article? That's a, is anyone an English major? It's an indefinite article, right? Thanks, John. Uh, Unfortunately, that was the only question that came back from the jury, which was not answered by the judge, which is, could you please define a single login? And I'm like, oh my god. It came down to the letter of A. Uh, and indefinite means one or more than one. Definite means only one. And that was literally what I feel was the reason why we lost that initial round. Now, that's not what we fought on for the appeal, uh, but like, can you imagine going through that journey and then literally coming back with a jury saying you're, you know, you're guilty of infringement, uh, patent's valid, blah, 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 blah. You take one on the chin and it's, a, it's not a fun experience. Uh, you know, what was amazing is the team, like, you know, uh, before we landed back in Toronto, had a plan, here's how we're changing the software, here's how we're updating our clients, here's how we're communicating to our staff. We were energized, we're like, this could actually save us money. Um, you know, always looking for the silver lining and whatever was, you know, going wrong. Uh, and we persisted over the next year and a bit to actually fight all the way up to the federal circuit level. where We actually had a complete vindication. Uh, so living up to your values, building a strong team, all of these things are, you know, things that can uh, not necessarily lead to the same outcome, but, you know, can help you overcome some of the major hurdles that as you build your companies, uh, you're going to face. Um, you know, no one builds a strong company without facing some of these hurdles. So, like, perseverance. Uh, I was a Montreal Canadiens fan growing up. Sorry, Toronto. <laughs> I don't know why I was wearing an Islanders jersey. Probably the only one that I had as a kid. Um, but that's me, my, my one brother, and my sister. You know, I, I, I really think as we, as we build an education system, don't lose sports, don't lose the arts, don't lose dance, don't lose all of these... these uh, these opportunities to develop perseverance and teach the value of sticking at something. Uh, you know, the, the ability for us to persevere through all these challenges uh, are what's going to build strong 
uh, leaders for, for tomorrow. Not that I am, you know, saying you have to do only these things, but I think, you know, it's a really important part. You know, today, these slides say 600 people. We're actually over 700 people today. Uh, we added uh, 350 people last year to the company, uh, and we added uh, about 150 the year before that. We're going through this massive growth uh, over the last three years. Uh, opening up offices all over the world, adding clients all over the world, um, really trying to build out a, a strong team. We're still having challenges. We're having lots of challenges as we scale up our organization. Uh, but we feel like we've got a, an incredibly good team uh, that's working through each and every one of those challenges, that's tackling them head on, that's not shying away from them, that's living up to those same core principles of transparency and honestness and the values that we built as a company. Uh, and, and we really do feel like we're just at the beginning of building this company. We feel like we're just getting started. There's a huge uh, runway uh, ahead and we're just working very hard to make sure that we're building uh, up to the expectations that are being set for us. You know, uh, we did uh, secure an $80 million investment. I can glad to talk about that. It's a small minority stake in the company. Uh, it was done on our, our terms. Um, and we're, you know, we did it uh, for a lot of different reasons, but the, the main one for us was to give us the confidence to go out there and um, build the vision that we wanted to build. Uh, and be able to tap into a, a whole network of expertise uh, that we didn't have uh, doing it ourselves. I'm flying along to leave room for some questions. We used to say the sky's the limit, then we won NASA as a client, so then we're like, maybe we can be on Mars one day. And then I'm, I'm here in Mars. <laughs> so uh, thanks very much for your time. Uh, any, any questions? Go ahead. So um, the question of stickability, you know, like so, so the, uh, you know, part of the educational experience is the interaction with other non-like people, variety, variation, et cetera. Sure. So the online learning experience tends to be isolated, or can be an isolating one, and also the ability for people to stick to it and to, to keep engaged versus letting it fall. And I'm yeah. just wondering how you m trying to manage to that and trying to deal with that issue. So. You know, I ask a lot of teachers, like, uh, what do you think of online learning relative to your classroom experience? And I am constantly surprised with their responses. Uh, many teachers, like my parents included, are educators, um, will say, I actually enjoy the online experience better than the classroom experience. Not that I d dislike the classroom experience, but I like it better. And you ask, okay, well, you're going to have to explain yourself. Uh, and, and they say, it's because I get to build a relationship with every student. Whereas in the classroom, I was only dealing with a certain pocket, either the elites or the middle or the bottom on a particular day, and I would rarely hear of the people in the middle, typically. Uh, and so it's, and you may have different experiences depending on what you're teaching, but you know, it, it, was, it was telling for me how uh, you could actually build a really engaging experience and build uh, a real uh, tutoring, almost like a one-on-one -on -one tutoring experience even in large class sizes in online uh, that uh, these teachers weren't able to, to create in, in a traditional classroom experience. And, 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 I, and I go back is because we can actually enable a whole bunch of time saving activities so that the teacher can actually spend more time with the, te with the students. So a good example is uh, doing audio feedback and video feedback for students on assignments with like simple annotation tools saves 43% of the time that it used to take to, to leave a written feedback for students. So if you can spend half your time that you used to spend marking assignments, that's a huge savings so you can actually spend more time leaving quality feedback. And then we also learn from like high quality teachers. Like there's this uh, teacher by the name of John Smallwood uh, that teaches at one of our clients. And he talks about like, uh, you know, how he doesn't make assignments like an endpoint and how he can, with his technology, be able to see all the feedback that he's ever left and uh, be able to pick from that and all the communication he's ever had with the student and be able to piece that together in a really well-crafted you know, piece of feedback that seems like a journey. So here's what I'm going to be looking for next time. Here's where I saw a lot of improvement. How's, how's the skiing going? Uh, and the students react to that, to the point where even though he's an online teacher, you've got, he's had articles written about him from students that are now attending McGill saying how he was the best teacher they, that, he, that they ever had. Uh, and so you know, I would argue that a lot of those uh, are misconceptions. And great teaching is great teaching, whether it's online or or face to face. Uh, and then on the engagement side, which is you know at the crux of a lot of this, 
if you, if you unpack personalization, it's all about really engagement uh, and really creating more of an adaptive learning experience. We've built a team of like uh, data scientists, uh, building up predictive modeling engines to the point now where we just ran the tests in Wisconsin. Uh, and we were able to predict by week two what their grades were going to be by week 18. And by week five, we had, in many cases, uh, between a 92, 0.92 and a 0.98 uh, confidence interval. So like very accurate forecasting uh, on multiple subject matter uh, across like, uh, time. And so what's interesting now is now that we know that the forecasts work, what's going to happen to those students this term? Because this will be the first semester that the teacher can trust the forecast because it's the first time it's actually been proven out. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see what do you do when you know the weather on Friday? Do you change? <laughs> do you do a different intervention? And then maybe we can even learn which interventions work. That was a long answer to that question. We'll skip over here. Could you talk more about the desire to learn product? What does it do? How do clients use it? How has it evolved? And what's the vision? What are you driving oh, towards? Wow. Do you, get, you want that answer? Okay, <laughs> all of it. Uh, so, so the, the, the product set includes like a traditional learning environment uh, that supports both online and blended experiences. So that's everything from like you've got tools in it like quizzing or discussions or instant messaging, content, assessments, learning activities, uh, really supporting all the learning and assessment of that learning and a whole bunch of other communication and collaboration tools built around it. And you've got like e-portfolios that support capturing and sharing the learning journey for students. So if you can imagine with your e-portfolio, you can go ahead and snap a photo, see something on the web, you just send it to your portfolio, highlight certain things, sends it off to your portfolio. So you can build like a whole collection of all of your learning experiences and decide who you want to share it with. Uh, we've got capture technology. So just like, I don't know if you're using our technology, that would be cool. So uh, U of T uses it, Ryerson uses it, a whole bunch of others use our capture technology to record the, the lecture and sort of flip the classroom. Uh, we've got mobile technology. We've got predictive modeling engines for analytics. Uh, and we've got also app building tools so that the schools can actually build mobile apps for all the different devices. So there's a breadth of technology that we bring to bear on solving some of the tough problems. Another great product that we just launched in uh, December is Binder, which is designed uh, to take all the textbooks and all the digital content and make it portable. So it can go offline and you know, annotate on top of things and highlight stuff that you want to highlight and then make it more searchable for students. Uh, so all kinds of really cool technology. Um, and what, sorry, did that answer that part of the question? Yeah. And what was the second part? Your vision, now that you have the funding, what are you driving for? Oh, the vision. Um, so w w there's a lot. <laughs> but the, the, at the crux of it is we want to support the institutional's mission, uh, institution's mission of being able to provide the best educational experiences they can, you know, best retention, best outcomes for the students, attract the best and brightest, give them the best learning experience that they have while at the same time also supporting the person that's going through that educational experience. So more around the personal learning environment. Uh, so tools are built for the student, built for the teacher, uh, built for the individual contributors in that bigger system. Uh, so we've got sort of like two camps uh, within the organization that are focused one on the, more on the student and one more on the organization and the instructors. Uh, and together I think they can start tackling some of the problems. So Binder is an example of something built for the students. Uh, whereas our learning environments are something that's built more for the institution to provide the best educational experience. Does that help? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned you guys have grown massively over the past. Tried. Years. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. How do you guys test for like culture fit? Because you talked about how you would, you know, sh tell the good, the bad, the ugly. Yeah. And those that believed in the vision stuck around. That those that didn't, left. Yeah. Is it like I imagine it's pretty hard to maintain? Maintain the, the culture as you grow. It's, uh, I'd say it's uh, always been one of the top priorities in the company. Um, we were pretty fortunate. We hired some great people into HR in the early days. Uh, like HR for us was hire number five and then hire number 12. Five was also HR slash project manager slash receptionist slash a bunch of other roles like most people in the company. <laughs> but uh, starting to build that culture early and then embedding it into the parts of the organization that will uh, support that culture, like HR and other parts of the organization, like the hiring managers, and setting the tone and leading by example. Uh, I, I have the same expense policy for me as, a, as anyone in the organization. I live by the same like, policies across, like not differentiating, like that's a huge thing for us. We do things like check your ego at the door. We have all kinds of little sayings that we use, uh, but it's a constant challenge. Uh, and then we also rely heavily on uh, references as we're doing the hiring. So is, is, will this person fit our culture or are they going to be 
you know, uh, you know, not, maybe not the best fit for the long term. But that's a big challenge. Go ahead. Um, I liked your story um, getting your first project and how you priced it. And so yeah, uh, that's probably a story I shouldn't have shared, but well, carry well, on. Actually, what I'd be <laughs> to hear how your pricing philosophy has evolved over time because it yeah. was probably cost plus at that time. And I just wondered, have you been able to move to more of a value creation model? How do you think about pricing? I think we, we always thought about it as value. Uh, and so, which also forces your organization to become more efficient. So analytics, we don't make any money off of analytics, but it's forcing our organization to become more efficient with the delivery of the analytics product. Um, and so we're pricing it because we know it's going to contribute a lot of value to our clients. And eventually we can bring our cost structures down to a point where, where it can scale. Um, so I think value-based pricing is a huge element of what we've, we've done as an organization. Um, you know, our, our philosophy is like, try to also get this into the hands of as many institutions as possible. So if you're a small school that want to provide the best learning solution for your students, we're a perfect fit. Even though there's a lot of really, if you're an incredibly large organization that has lots of complexity, like a whole state, we're the best solution in the market. So how do you straddle those two, two spectrums? And a lot of it comes down to how we do pricing strategies, but also how we, uh, even though we might lose a few dollars on some of the smaller accounts, it forces our teams to get more efficient with how we deliver the service, uh, so we can we can uh, we can actually serve that part of the market. And also f echoes a little bit of the um, the education system's values, which is trying to provide a little bit better equal equalizing some of the access to the educational resources. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. We've also tried to keep our pricing fairly flat over the years, whereas our competition tends to just go like that, which also helps us a little bit. Go ahead. Hi. Um, yeah, I'm interested in learning about how is Desire to Learn implementing uh, online education in third world countries where technology is limited as well mm -hmm. as uh, education is needed the most. Yeah, I think uh, we do have a lot of projects in like uh, I wouldn't say Brazil is definitely not third world, but um, but projects in, in areas in, within Brazil that are ch are challenged. Uh, we've got projects going on in Kenya. We're working with some foundations on rolling out education globally. Uh, so there's there's all kinds of efforts going on. What we're finding is, a, is the biggest challenge in, uh, in developing, developing markets uh, is that there's a capacity issue with educators being able to understand uh, how, to, how to leverage the technology, but also how to educate. Uh, there's a, a severe lack of educators globally, uh, especially at, uh, at a quality level that's going to deliver a great experience for the students. And so there's a lot of capacity building that needs to still occur as we roll out these programs on a, on a bigger basis. Uh, some of it is uh, open access. So we're working with a lot of partners to you know, provide free or low cost educational solutions out to the market. And then you know, there's, and there's all kinds of ways to sort of um, generate value from that downstream. But you know, it's, it's going to be a, a continual challenge, I think. I think the, the best thing that we can do is when we go into these markets uh, is to learn as much as we can and not just come in with like, here's our solution and apply it, but to actually understand what that market's looking for and be able to adapt to the local context. Uh, we've seen that work very, very effectively in some of the markets that we're, we're doing a lot of business in today. Can I, and just before I leave that one, and we're partnering like crazy with people that already distribute into those markets. Uh, Oxford University Press is a great example of that, which has an incredibly small price point uh, to do like things like language training or other things, uh, and, but uh, offers so much value to those institutions. So by finding great partners like them or Sanima, uh, which is another huge publisher or others, that have, have that ability to reach those markets, that's another great strategy. Go ahead. Sorry, uh, we, sorry before we do, Michael, yeah. there's a hand up over here. No? Right here. Sorry, we'll come back to you, Michael. Could you uh, expand a bit more about the early days of bootstrapping, and was that by necessity or by, by choice? Uh, I, I could tell you lots of funny stories. Like, if someone ever invests in you, I'll, I'll buy you dinner. Um, like, you, you'd hear all kinds of crazy stories. Like, this is a crazy idea. That, you know, there's, there's a lot of people that, uh, that don't, don't necessarily uh, believe in your idea or your ability to execute when you're 22 and still in university. Uh, I think that's changed a lot. I, like, I really think that you know, we're seeing, they're seeing that transition uh, because I, I'm seeing a huge startup culture now from the universities. Um, but, you know, uh, so do we have to bootstrap it? Uh, well, no, probably didn't have to. We probably could have gone out and gotten some funding. Um, you know, if, if I look at like what were some of the basic sources of funding, like it was like my savings, uh, one of my friends, uh, Bill, who's a U of T grad, uh, before he even finished university, 
he gave me a loan of ten thousand dollars and it was the first money that actually went into our corporate bank account uh, my parents unknowingly to me mortgaged their house uh, to support me through some tough periods I mean like you know uh, I think all of them regret not taking equity in those early days. Um, <laughs> teasing a little, we're, we're, you know, they're happy. Um, but you know, we, uh, you know, you, you do what you have to do to really build a, a, a strong business. And frankly, I didn't know the the venture world. I didn't know the investment world. Uh, and uh, you know, so I was just pursuing building a great business. And I also saw like our competitors buying up all the other venture backed companies uh, in the space. And I always wondered, like, why are they doing that? Like, you know, they, they keep telling me that they don't want to ever sell, and like a year later, they're sold. And like, and then, well, then you, you, know, you ask them after the fact, and it's like, well, my board forced me to sell it. And so, that's, so that, that to me is why when we did do the investment, that we did make sure it was a minority stake, uh, and that we had aligned vision with the, the, the investors. You know, our investors are committed to making sure that we are the global leader in this space. Uh, and that we're going to build an incredible business that goes out there and really has a big impact on the world. Uh, and they're long-term committed to that vision. And that, that part is uh, something that's exciting for us. Uh, but if, if you, you know, we've, there's lots of great examples of building a business and selling it you know, the, next, the next year for a huge multiple and then building another one. And then that's cool too. Uh, I think you just have to understand what you want to do. And, and in my case, I look at transforming the world's uh, education system that's something I could see doing for the rest of my life. Um, I probably won't ever be done. Uh, and it's something that I feel like uh, even if I built a company and sold it, I'd probably want to do this anyway, which is odd because I, I work with a lot of people that are doing their own foundations now and they want to help improve education. And I'm like, well, that's what I do during my day job. This is awesome. Uh, and so it goes back to that, that passion and following that passion. And if you can align all of those interests, the investment interests, your interests, build a great business at the same time, uh, that's I think pretty cool and doesn't happen that often. Go ahead. Oh, I wanted to go I want to go back to really the genesis of your idea cuz you're yeah. you're an engineer who came up with this so you're you and well I guess you were you when you started you built yeah. this this framework uh, technological framework but you're not an educator by trade so uh, I, I was not a software developer it, either. It almost seemed like you you built a solution now you're mm -hmm. you had to go off and find the problem. So how did you get did you have to get educators on board to convince educators to buy this or uh, that, that was one mistake we made which is we didn't hire salespeople fast enough you're gonna laugh I mean like we only had three salespeople up until like 2010 mm -hmm. uh, at that time we had 200 people in the company well not 200 140 I mean you know it that's something we should have invested in I, I think uh, getting those expertise on board but you know I was looking at it from like I want to change so I'm willing to experiment and what I was also really interested in doing is listening very closely to the clients. And I was really fortunate. Uh, there's some great people at Waterloo, at Guelph, and other schools uh, that gave me a lot of great advice on how to build the technology and the direction to take it. Uh, and we benefited tremendously from that. They also hated it when I said, well, uh, no. And so, which made us build probably the most flexible learning system on the planet. I would argue it is. Uh, there's no one that can configure the system out of the box as easily as we can. Uh, and it's because in the early days, we were, well, if Waterloo wants to do this way, we'll let them do it this way. And then we got tired of like if statements in the, in the code. As, <laughs> and so we, we actually built the framework properly from the ground up. Uh, and that, I think, allowed us to scale rather quickly. But did you get some pushback from people who thought that you were just trying to build a system so you could stay in bed till 2 in the afternoon and then log on and take your class and then... <laughs> Well, I, I was at the office at 6.30 in the morning and wouldn't leave until probably 2 a.m. And I did that seven days a week for many years. So no, I, I, I never got that. I got, who is this young guy coming in here to talk to us? I remember one great uh, guy, guy by the name of Arlen. It was awesome. He introduced me to the, the, his faculty and said, you know, at first I was like expecting someone to look more like me with gray hair. Uh, but, you know, I had this 20... You know, at that time I was 23, this guy show up, John, uh, but don't worry, he's growing on me, I think you'll like him. <laughs> uh, you, you run into that, you run into all those barriers, but use it as an op use like judo or, you know, uh, flip it. Use their energy and say, well, well, I can bring a fresh perspective, this is new ideas, I can, this, I can bring the latest technology, you know, I'm fresh from school. You know, there's all kinds of ways to like work around that. Go ahead. 
So how did you form your initial team in terms of, you know, when you were looking for number two, three, four, and how did you incentivize them a little bit to take kind of that risk? Other than pay? Um, <laughs> like, so, so that's, it, no, it's a great question. So uh, when I first did it, I hired my brother, my sister, my other brother, my friend, my other friend, and that was the summer, and that actually it was awesome. It was an incredible experience, and like it actually brought my family together in a way that was pretty pretty cool. Um, and then we went back to school. My brother was in high school, so he had to go back to school. Uh, my sister was in university; she had to go. You know, so it went back to just being me. And then the next team that I built was, um, you know, uh, people that are recruited from the university. So these were people that are really interested in going down the, down that same path. Some of which were. You know, not quite friends, but I knew them. Uh, and so people that had computer science backgrounds, uh, engineering, all kinds of other skills that I didn't have, I was looking for that complementary team. Um, and, it, you know, you go through ups and downs with that. Uh, in my case, I didn't know how to code, so I started taking courses on, you know, SQL and all kinds of other things that I could in computer science in my last year. Uh, I did epistemology of systems thinking, which is a PhD level program, which allowed me to focus on my, my project on the education system and mapping it all out. So that was kind of, you know, y you do what you can to sort of like pull together the resources. Uh, and then, you know, what I was really lucky. I hired uh, a guy by the name of Brian Pearson, Brian Saprin, and two Brians. They argue over who was the first Brian. Uh, and then uh, Jeremy Odger, uh, these people are still with the company. I hired some incredible co-ops, Dave, David, uh, David Lockhart and Daryl McMillan. They're now full-time with the company. Uh, and, you know, I still hired my sister back <laughs> when, she, when she was done school. And then eventually I hired the other family members too. But that's a long story. They're not all uh, engaged. But the, the, uh, the building of that core team was critical. We, we even got to the point where we actually had people volunteering in, like, remember like 99, 2000? Some of you do. Um, like that was boom time, right, for technology. End of 2000, 2001, not so much. But like we were having people volunteer at the company, even during those fa phases of our development. Uh, and why? Because they just love the vision, they love the passion, they love being able to apply something to something that was really creative. Uh, and, and we've built the company based upon uh, people that really wanted to solve the problem um, more than anything else. And it was, it was interesting. I, our, our first interview question was, what barrier exists to education? And like literally, no one had a problem with that question. No, you're blind, you have the accessibility, whatever. Like they would come up with tons of reasons. The second question was a tough one, which is, okay, now how do you solve that problem? And there weren't that many people that could come up with on the spot solutions to that. Uh, but a lot of the really good ones, all the people that we hired could answer that question really effectively. Uh, and so it was people that were already thinking about it, that were engaged in it, that were really committed to the bigger vision. John, you had a question? And sorry, and we'll go back to Michael. Well, it wasn't related to what you were just saying, so if you want to... Oh, no, go ahead. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. I just wondered how your corporate culture changed from when you were, or evolved from when you were very small to when you got large, because I don't imagine it stayed exactly the same, did it? Uh, no, well, not exactly the same, no, but I th I th a lot of the core elements are still there are still intact, like how we tackle problems, how we come together as a team, how we collaborate, how we drive for innovation, how we uh, really put a client's first. Uh, all, all of that is still still very core to the company, even at the size we are where we are today. I would have thought that being larger would tend to bend some of these things a little bit. You do. You see some micro, micro cultures popping into the organization, which you try to flatten as quickly as possible. Um, and you know, those are tough. Like, like I, I, you know, there's groups uh, in the organization today where we're struggling with some of the cultural fit issues. Uh, you know, if 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 there's a, a problem, we need to be on it and we need to fix it. You know, and we don't rest until it's addressed. Uh, and you know, not everyone has that same attitude. And the ones that do fit, the ones that don't, tend to tend to not fit in the long term. Is that so a nine to five job? Right? Uh, you know, we used to work people pretty tough. Like. Uh, I remember co-ops at 12 o'clock at night were like, is this guy ever going to go home? And they're like, do I, am I allowed to go home? <laughs> I mean, you know, it used to be nuts. Uh, today is not as bad, right? We're, we're very respective of people's families. Uh, and we also are very respective of the fact that people can also work from home as well. Um, you know, we, we don't do nine to five though. That's never been the culture of the company. It's always been results. Go ahead, in the back. And then, sorry, and then we'll do Michael. Um, so there's, there's a growing, um, 
EdTech startup scene here in Toronto and Waterloo. Um, All over the world by the looks of it. Absolutely. Yep. So how do you see desire to learns sort of role in help being strengthen the local sort of startup community and yeah. you know uh, moving forward? That's a, that's a great question. So we're doing a few things. We've opened up all of our APIs, uh, so we can actually enable ed tech companies to actually go uh, tie their technology into our platforms, creating more of an ecosystem model. So if you want to tap into 10 million users, um, you know, this is a great opportunity to do that. And we're seeing probably about a few hundred people that have already done that, uh, and hopefully we'll see the momentum build on it. We open, uh, leverage open standards uh, from that perspective. Uh, we're also personally responsible for funding some of these uh, incubators um, and also trying to, um, trying to actually spark the funding for some of the, some of the startup activity. Uh, we're doing some investments. Uh, we're, we're trying to take a, a, we're not perfect at this by any stretch of the imagination. We're trying to take a, a real big interest in the ed tech startup space. Uh, I'm, I'm a huge believer in like an ecosystem model versus like everyone has to die kind of model. I'm not that model. Um, not that I'm saying any of our competitors are, um, <laughs> but, but we believe that together we can go out and, and move, a, uh, move a lot of mountains. And so, we, we, you know, you need to find out your, your, you know, where the boundaries are and, and, and how you bump up against each other. Um, but the, uh, I think there's going to be a, a, certainly a vibrant uh, opportunity in the ed tech space, no question. Yeah. Go ahead, in the back. So, yeah, she was, she, that was the one I was originally targeting, Michael. <laughs> Um, I'm just wondering about your, your own journey from the entrepreneur yeah. to sort of knowing everything of all the decisions of the company to having 600 people and yeah. what sort of learnings or challenges you've had along the way to, to grow that quickly. Mm -hmm. um, having maybe never had, you know, tons of managers or bosses your, yourself yeah. as mentors. Um, I, yeah, that's a, I get asked that question sometimes. Uh, I, I've been really fortunate to like uh, because I believe very strongly in hiring people that are far better than you um, at, you know, a whole bunch of stuff. And so, you know, I, we hired Dennis Cavillman, who used to be the chief operating officer for RIM. Uh, we hired Brandon Nussie, who used to be the CFO for another company and CEO for another company. We've got, I think, four ex-CEOs working in the organization in various different roles. I mean, we are going after the, the best talent that we can find, and I don't dictate to this group. I say, here's what my vision is. Let's work together to actually craft a shared vision. And then they work together with their teams to create a shared vision within their teams. That culture of like trying to learn from each other is embedded in the, in the, in the organization. Um, I also learn a lot from our clients. I learn a lot from the other CEOs in my local networks uh, between Toronto and Waterloo and, and other areas. Uh, and I try to learn a lot from, you know, education and learning and reading and all kinds of other stuff. But I don't know. It's you know a lot. Uh, what I find, you know, as you're building your company, you get hit with these tough decision points, and um, the easiest way to make those decisions, in my mind, is like, go, what, 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 what would, like, what's the right thing to do? What's like, look at your values. Look at, look at who you are, and how would I want to be treated? Like, it's it's the, it's like really the, the basics, versus like uh, always thinking about, well, how's this going to impact my bottom line? Because that's not always the right way to think about it. Uh, thinking about it from like a dual dual bottom line structure, where you're thinking about like the you know uh, the financial impact, but at the same time thinking about your you know your long term impact on society. I think that's been a huge guiding force for, for me. I, I could go on for an hour on that topic, but hopefully that gives you a few hints. Michael, <laughs> just, I was just curious because the you know this this product kind of democratizes education in many regards, yeah. but the right. the educational system is is unbelievably uh, stuck in terms of yeah. union uh, perspectives, in terms yeah. of good versus not so good teachers, in terms of of teachers that have a, a, a technology bent versus totally a technology, and how do you manage to that in terms of selling it into the system and also manage it because it, it opens up it's become sort of the uh, what's the name of that product glass door which talks mm -hmm. about what companies are like and how they interview and etc how does it mm -hmm. how do you deal with that democratization because the unions are an unbelievably strong force in the educational k-12 yeah um, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of, of glass door because it's not actually true transparency because you don't actually know who's leaving the comments I think more authentic transparency is, is important that's aside um, how, how do we how do we tackle those problems um, or how do the educational systems tackle it? It's a huge change management issue. 
huge change management issue. So when we talk about like flip classroom, like I say, hey, you know, this is not what everyone should be doing. Flip the classroom, like, you know, students as consumers, not just or students as producers, not just consumers. Well, then you go, okay, well, how do we actually do that? And that's a huge challenge for the institutions. Like, you know, they've got to work through their rules. Like, I don't get paid to lecture, or that's or I get paid to lecture. Uh, you know, there's all these challenges, and then you get into all kinds of rules that have been established. You look at tenure track. You look at all these different challenges. What I'm, what I'm amazed at, though, is um, how willing people are, are today, maybe not 10 years ago, to have that dialogue and to actually work with the faculties and work with the educators and work with the administration and work with all the key stakeholders to actually enact change. I've never in, in my history seen more willingness to enact change in the education system than I see today. I've, I've never seen it. And it's been in the last, I'd say, two years. It's just been a flip. And there's a lot of nervousness about it. Um, you know, we've built actually a whole group in our organization that helps people through what we call academic transformations. Uh, so here's how others have done it. Here's the best practices we can bring to bear. Here's some tips and guidelines. And here's some, some things that we've seen not work. Um, you're really trying to do that? Like, what's, what are you trying to drive towards? You know, it's basic, a lot of it's basic change management and communication. Um, but how, how, do you, how do you, it's education, it's sharing, sharing of ideas, it's collaborating together to sort of help enact that change. That's, it's not an easy challenge. Yeah. How long does it take to implement? Like, you know. Our techno the technology like takes like an hour. <laughs> but uh, but uh, I know the, the change process would have, uh, I'm sorry, I don't mean to, to yeah. grab on. Go to the next, sorry. No, the, well, it's a great question. Like, it, like the actual technology doesn't take very much time. The sales cycle takes a long time. And the actual implementation, like the the uh, the reeducation, the reintegration, takes takes some time. But what I'm what I'm amazed at is like everyone thinks it's like oh this is this huge barrier that we're never going to overcome. I've, we've never had a failed implementation. Uh, uh, faculty uh, get incredibly excited about the the change, uh, and all of a sudden there's this tidal wave of momentum that builds around the projects. A lot of like a lot of it's just like well you know. Maybe if, maybe if they don't like it, then there's, you, you get the resistance. But uh, if you can build that p positive momentum, you can, you can build on that energy. But it, overcoming those objections is important. Go ahead in the back. Uh, this is actually a really good segue uh, into what I wanted to understand. I know your target market is K-12 to and then post-secondary. Yeah. I wondered if you could comment on where your uh, growth could be. And the second yeah. part of that would be the K-12 to doesn't seem quite as straightforward as the post-secondary in that you don't have necessarily distance learners to the degree that you might. And how, if that is the growth, not sure if it is or isn't, um, kind of the same question. How do you, how do you force that forward if, if um, you know, people agree, maybe not the unions, but yeah. the general public agrees that it's the right way to go? Well, I interestingly, like, uh, some of the unions in Ontario for K-12 are actually using our technology to educate their membership. Uh, you know, K-12 in the province is rolling it out to a half a million students in a blended environment. They used to think only online, now it's fully blended. Um, no, we're seeing change happening like, at a crazy pace in K-12. Um, and we, we do see a lot of change uh, has already occurred or is occurring very quickly in the higher education. Uh, and interesting enough, we've been dragged... Uh, and now are incredibly excited about the corporate marketplace, where you know we're seeing top tier Fortune th 35, you know Fortune 1000 companies, uh, fire and rescue organizations, police, uh, you know government, healthcare organizations, all adopting this technology. Uh, and what's interesting is the model that we've built in terms of the, how we've approached the problem is quite unique in the corporate setting, and, it's, and I think it's why it's leading us to winning all these deals is because all of a sudden we built technology that really not just helps with the dissemination of knowledge. It helps with the creation, and it helps with breaking down some of these access barriers. Uh, and so, you know, uh, even though we only had a corporate sales team of one person, you know, two years ago, you know, it represented 20% of our business. Uh, so, you know, we're we're seeing opportunity abounding, uh, and and I think you know we put up these artificial walls of K12 and higher ed and corporate, and I don't know why. Yeah, I don't know why. And, I, and I'm a really big, strong believer in lifelong learning. Uh, and that's why we're tackling it both from the personal side as well as from the institutional side. Go ahead. Can you uh, solve a uh, 
paradox for me. Uh, my youngest son, he is self-learned. He loves YouTube and he learns from peers. But the moment I advise him to take Udemy or other courses that adult teaching in class, he totally refuses to take it. You tell him to take these courses? Yeah. Wow, that's interesting. Um, I don't like. I I, uh, I think a huge challenge with uh, with this more self-directed educational experience is uncovering and unlocking that motivation uh, within the students. Uh, in K twelve, it's really easy to s because you get told you have to take math, you have to take science, you take biology, you take chemistry. And you're told and you're dictated all the way along. You kind of get the transition a little bit in university. At my program, I didn't get a choice until like my third year, which was probably okay because I, you know, it gave me a breadth of knowledge that I never thought I needed, and then I'm now applying the stuff that I didn't think I needed in the job that I'm doing today. Uh, and so, you know, but 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 sparking that self-directed learning has got to be one of the key things that we focus on at an early age and all the way through. Um, but I, you got to find out what motivates them, uh, what inspires them, and and I think uh, I think the I think the you're probably running into like a peer influence there pretty aggressively. If he doesn't have a whole bunch of classmates that he knows in the class, then he's probably not that interested. Uh, so yeah, there's there's a lot of challenges yet to overcome. Yeah, any any easy answers for that one? I, I don't know of any. Yeah, motivation is one we're still trying to unlock. Uh, we're, we're, we're doing a lot of research into it. Go ahead. Do you foresee a, a day or is it happening where a private company will essentially create a university where... It's happening all the time. Yeah, but, yeah I know, but in, in terms of replacing, I mean, you know, there, there are certain degrees that you don't get as much from kind of these pr private funded universities as you would from public really? institutions. Yeah. So like... Uh, how would you do a, I mean, how would you do a chemistry degree over the internet, strictly over the internet? It's done all the time. Like, uh, like, like I, I've met people in Qatar, in the Middle East, that were like, I just finished my nursing program, and I'm now the dean of nursing here in the university, and I did it all online using your technology. Like, while I was raising three kids and working two jobs. And you're like, that's impressive. That's motivation. Um, you know, and, and then her big complaint in there is like, well, no one here really is that in, interested in learning because they're all too wealthy and they don't, they don't, they don't need it. So, uh, like, everyone has their own problems. If you've got too much money, it's a problem. If you've got too little, it's a problem. Like, there's all these challenges, and I think that's where personalizing the experience comes into play. Uh, you know, uh, th does that help? The think? interactive, I mean, a nurse, I, I would like to know that my nurse actually has, you know, put a needle in someone's arm at some point in their... Well, that's why, that's why I don't, I, I'm not a, like, we, there's all kinds of virtual labs that do that right now too, but uh, I'm a big believer in blended learning as well as online. I don't. I'm not like advocating for all classrooms to disappear. I think that's a that would be a waste. Uh, I think uh, I, I just think that more and more of it's going to go online. A couple of last questions. <laughs> go ahead. So with your analytics, are you parsing out different learning styles? Is that so with our analytics, we've built, uh, over the last four years, it's taken us a lot longer than we thought it was going to originally, built uh, some really cool algorithms that can actually look at a whole bunch of indicators and build very accurate predictions. And those predictions get stronger every time a course is offered. Uh, and, so, and it also provides beautiful data visualizations to the faculty and eventually to the students. Uh, that actually shows like sociograms, showing the strength of the connections between the different students in the class shows like how they're progressing through, shows the subject matter that they're stumbling upon, uh, that's, not, not, that's not getting, you know, it's not sinking in, uh, you know, and then eventually we'll hopefully make it even smarter again. It's, like I, I, I think the analytics has a huge potential to just completely revolutionize education. We also just did an acquisition of a company called Degree Compass. So Bill Gates, uh, you know, I'm not sure if you know him, but he, uh, he, he compared it like Harvard, having a baby with Netflix. I don't know sure how that, <laughs> so, someone did. I don't know if, it, yeah, I think it was him. Um, but the idea of being able to guide students on which courses to take even um, based upon their past performance and their degree. And, and so, you know, in Canada, you don't have a huge completion issue, a huge retention issue. Like, you know, uh, some of our clients like McGill have 94% retention or 95% retention, same with Guelph and others. Um, in the U.S. and other markets, it's sometimes we've got clients that have 30% retention of students. Um, so, you know, if we can help with that completion challenge. Uh, in Ontario, we've, 
we've done a, played a small role in helping improve the education system for K-12 to get them over 80% completion. Um, but there's a huge effort on that front. And analytics, I think, will, will play a role. It's kind of like having like a GP, like I like the analogy uh, Lone Star uses, GPS for education. Like, you know where you want to, you may not even know where you want to go, but how about they set a destination, at least give you a roadmap to get there. This is 30% postgraduate uh, <coughs> university? No, this is like un undergrads. K-12. Undergrads. And, and K-12 in some regions. Like a, only 30% finish in Brazil and, I don't know, the Maldives, like less than that. Um, so like, you know, completion is still a massive issue at all levels in education globally. Like Canada is probably a rare exception. So it's weird talking to a university and they're like, you know, retention is not a huge issue for us. And you're like, what? <laughs> um, but it's true. What do you look for as an investor? And uh, what, what advice do you have for entrepreneurs or edtech startups that are trying to create the technology of the future? Uh, so what we look for is like an incredibly strong team that's really passionate, uh, building some incredible technology, and that has a huge business opportunity in front of them. You know, just a perfect storm, of course. Um, but you know, and even in even in the small number of acquisitions that we've done, um, that's what we've looked for as well. And in some cases, they've got a great opportunity. They just couldn't get the critical mass or didn't have the full team. And by joining forces, um, we're able to go after the market more aggressively. And you know, in in each of the acquisitions that we've done so far, and hopefully this continues, uh, we've kept the entire team intact. We've grown it cra like crazy, and you know, we're. we're or we're building on a collective vision for where we're going. And I, and I hope that we can continue down that path as we, as we look to, to grow our company. Let's go ahead. So in your model, do you actually take care of the physical well-being <coughs> of the, the student between K and 12, or is it just more the intellectual learning process? Uh, you, you, some of our clients take using our technology help with other aspects, uh, not just the learning. Um, so like Brisbane Grammar is a great example of a client that does field trips, they have alumni sessions, they have parents involved, they do fundraising, they do, you know, uh, they plan a whole bunch of activities, they fill in surveys. I mean, like, it's like the whole spectrum of what happens at the school is leveraging that, that platform. Like, we don't do, like, nutrition for learning kind of stuff yet. Um, I'm not sure if we will, but I, I think partnering with some of those programs is going to be important for us because I think it does have an impact on the end outcomes. Uh, it's just not uh, it's just not our core competency, and there's some great organizations that do that. But, you know, but I think partnering is probably a better idea for us there. Yeah. How you can help students to overcome ADD and other learning disabilities problems? So uh, there's a, a a great story from um, from a uh, from the person that runs the CBET program at the University of Waterloo. His son uh, has been leveraging courses being offered by one of our clients, uh, Virtual High School, uh, and in that case, uh, his son's now achieving like 90s and 100s. He shares this story openly. It's, it's an incredible story where his son was failing out of the traditional school, has a learning disability, uh, and all of a sudden, going into this environment, uh, was able to focus. Uh, the client was able to adapt the, the course to saying, hey, you know, if you find a problem, don't, get, don't give up. Report it to us. And it became a challenge. <laughs> uh, so being able to, again, personalize that educational experience, we're seeing actually have a pretty massive improvement in uh, retaining those students that even have learning disabilities. The big one for us, too, is uh, we're the most accessible platform for people that are blind. That's been a, a pride of our organization and something we, we, we work on relentlessly. Um, so, like, you know, get all the certifications, go well beyond them, uh, really focus on it. We've also worked on a lot of fine motor control issues, small visual disabilities, dyslexia, dyslexia <laughs> and, a, and a bunch of other challenges. Uh, and, it's, and you spend a lot of time building technology. Our team talk about this all the time, so they do like talks on how to build technology to be accessible. Uh, we've partnered with groups like U of T in the past and, and many other clients. Um, partnered with Yuda uh, like Trevanis, I think she was here at U of T. Now she's at uh, OCAD. Like, there's all kinds of other groups that have been working extensively on these programs, and we try to work with them to build in the best practices. Got a question? I was curious. Then you saw the light on sales some years later. Yeah. And, and uh, <clears throat> I should have saw the light on that earlier. What's that? The sales guys, the highest paid people in the company now. Uh, they're high paid. Let's let's just say that. Uh, but we we also um, we also pay other people very well as well. So um, you know, I think I think you know, I think the sales role is a tough one. You're on the road a lot. You're you're building relationships with clients. It's I think people underestimate how how difficult and how challenging that role is. 
Uh, and yes, they're, you know, if you're an awesome salesperson, you are incredibly well compensated. Thank you.